We're still in this section in Colossians chapter 1, uh, between verses 9 and 13. Um, last time we had done kind of an overview of this section and um, talked about how Paul had been praying for them to be to be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. It said bearing fruit in every good work, being uh, increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, um, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And then he said, he has delivered us from darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Um, <clears throat> we had focused in on verse nine, where Paul um, had said um, that he had been praying for them to be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we talked about um, what does it look like to uh, know and understand God's will. Like, how can we know God's will? Um, we said that the first way to know God's will is to be in his word. We immerse ourselves in God's word because his word is a lamp into our feet and a light unto our path. God said, so shall the word be that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me void, but it will always accomplish the purpose for which I sent it, um, that it's living and active. Um, God's word bears a, bears a harvest. It bears fruit in our hearts, but the amount of fruit that it bears depends on the condition of our heart. We talked about the second way of knowing God's uh, will. It, which is prayer, um, where the word is understanding God and his will from a <clears throat> theological, conceptual kind of a way. Prayer is understanding God um, as our Father and getting to know him as our Father. And in this way, he can communicate to us his will. Um, we begin to become familiar with him in the same way that we become familiar with our earthly family through relationship, through spending time with them and getting to understand and know them. This is how prayer functions in our life. This is intimacy. It's dialogue. It's conversation. It's relationship with our Father. And so we seek him in prayer. We seek his will. And a lot of times in prayer, this is how he will communicate specifically, maybe um, into our lives, um, some part of his will for us in regards to the lives of other people. Um, the, the third way was being filled with the very spirit of the living God, that um, you know Christ is in us through his spirit, that he has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, that, that, that Paul declares later that he, um, in, in Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. And so if, you know, if, if Christ is in us through his spirit and all the fullness of God uh, dwells, is pleased to dwell in Christ, then in a real way, we are really brought into this intimacy with the triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, just as Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, that we would be one just as he is one, you know? <clears throat> and so, um, but out of all this, see, Paul's praying that they'd be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And this is how we can know what God's will is. Um, but he prays this so that, so as to, that they would be able to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. And so I want to hang out in this section um, right now, just in this this little kind of first part of verse 10 here. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. This word walk here just means the way that we conduct our life, right? The way that we live our life or conduct ourselves in the world during our lifetimes. And so Paul is really just um, calling them to uh, the, to conduct their lives in a way that's fitting to those whom has, God has called saints, right? Like in Romans chapter 1, Paul says to those who are in Rome, to all who are in Rome, call, uh, beloved of God called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Saints means holy ones, hagios. And in, 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 when we are called into relationship with Christ, we're adopted into the family of God. We are made righteous by the blood of Jesus, and we're called to live holy just as he is holy, right? And we do this by the Spirit of God within us, by his power within us. Um, but we're to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and worthy of our calling. Paul uses this terminology throughout the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. In Philippians, um, in chapter 1, he says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And, and in um, 1 Thessalonians, Paul tells them, We charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. In other words, the way that the Lord lived out his life, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was on this earth in his earthly ministry, he said he only speaks the things um, that the Father, or he speaks the things the Father tells him, and he only did the things that he sees the Father doing. He says, look, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? And, and, and in this way, Jesus lived his life in a manner worthy of his Father. Um, fully pleasing to him, even to where when he was baptized, he came up out of the water. Remember, the, the spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove, and that a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, in him I am well pleased. 
right? This is how Jesus lived out his life. And, and, and we long to please him, right? And that's what this word pleasing means, fully pleasing to him. It, it doesn't speak just to our actions, but to the desires of our hearts that we would not just check off a list of I better do this, this, and this and go to church and pray and read my Bible. No, no, like we do those things because we desire to know him because we, we, we've been changed by him and he's put his spirit in us and he begins to change the very desires of our hearts and cause us to long for him. Like David said, like a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul thirsts for you, O God. This is the change that Jesus is, that through his spirit is, is making within us to cause us to desire to live a life. We, we long to please him. And this is something that he's doing in us. In Psalm chapter 37, he says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. What that means is that he's literally changing your desires. Like you begin to desire the things that please him. The way that you live your life, your affections, the things that you love, the things that you live for, all that changes as you change. Behold, old things have passed away. All things have become new. And this is that picture again of Ezekiel where he, said that he had prophesied, God said, I'm going to put my spirit in you. And I'm going to cause you to walk in my statutes and obey my commands. And I'm going to remove the heart of stone and I'm going to put in its place a heart of flesh. This is him changing us from the inside out, conforming us into the image of his son. Right? And in fact, in Galatians, um, Paul says, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. It's like we're being made like we're adopted into the family, but we're being conformed into the image of Jesus himself. Just as he cried out, Father, like if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. We have this relationship with our father. He's our father. And if you are no longer a slave, but a son, if so, then you're an heir through God, Paul says in Galatians. See, God's spirit is literally changing us, changing our desires, and out of this gratefulness and thankfulness that is within us for all that he's done in us and, and all that he's doing in us and all that he's doing in the lives of people around us through us, like this causes us to cry out to him, Abba, Father, we want to please our Lord in the way that we live and the way that we love and in, in our desires and in our affections and in the things that we pursue and in how surrendered and yielded we are to his spirit within us. He says, fully pleasing to him. So what this means to me is as we're living our lives, we're seeking to please him, okay? And, and this is going to cause some conflict sometimes in our lives with the people around us because when we're living our lives to fully please him, it, it's going to make some people feel uncomfortable. And see, those people, they want us to behave in a way that, that, that makes them feel comfortable, and yet we're not called to make people feel comfortable. We're not called to live in a manner worthy of the Lord making people comfortable and pleasing them. We're called to please him him with our lives, right? And sometimes it won't be a conflict. Like the way that God is changing and shaping us is also making us into better people. Like, you know, that's what the fruit of the spirit is. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control. Like that's all stuff that relates to the people around us most of the time, right? As that comes out of us, we become a blessing to the people around us, but sometimes it will cause conflict. And so we're not to live our lives to please other people, but at the same time, we're also not to live our lives to please ourselves. Oh, but but that's what the world is telling us we're supposed to live for, isn't it? Oh, like, I, I worry about my kids because this is what the world is teaching them. That, that you should follow your heart and follow your dreams and live to follow your own passions. Every whim of passion that you have, just embrace it and, and take it. Like, that's you. That's you. That's the real you. Be true to yourself chase after whatever makes you happy but that's not living that's hedonism that's not taking up your cross and following after him that's not living in a manner worthy of the lord fully pleasing to him and, and that road of hedonism that's 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 putting yourself on the throne it's taking god off of his rightful place in your heart the throne of your heart and it's putting yourself there but god will not share his throne with anyone we are to let him take the rightful place of the throne of our hearts, yield ourselves to him. And what's funny is as he saves us and as he puts his spirit within us and he begins to mold and shape us, we find that all of our joy and all of our peace and all the contentment that we ever desired and longed for, it's right here in him and in living for him. And that we can live to, to please him, to, to love him and to know him and to be known by him. That's contentment. 
that's peace. Like, do you want to understand the reason for which you were created? The reason for which you exist? What is your purpose on this earth? Then you need to understand how to live in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. And to know that, you have to, under, you have to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. In other words, you need to immerse yourself in his word. It means you need to enter into deep and intimate and real prayer with the Lord where you're speaking and you're listening, where you're asking and requesting, and you are waiting and listening and receiving. And that you need to let, you need salvation. You need to be saved. You need Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You need to turn from your sin. And you need to turn to him and ask him, Lord, I pray that you'd forgive me of my sin. Please forgive me, a sinner. I pray that you'd redeem me by the blood of your son, Jesus, that you'd make me whole. And when you do that and return, turn from your sin and confess your sins and, and you give him your heart and you yield to him, he seals you with his Holy Spirit. He begins to change you from the inside out and make you into the man or the woman that he had always destined and designed for you to be. The person that he had in his mind and in his heart before he created all of the world. How do we do this? How do we live in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him? Paul's going to begin to spell out what that looks like. In, in bearing fruit in every good work and increasing continually in the knowledge of God, right? Both both like theoretical and, and, and relational, right? And, and then being strengthened with all power for all endurance and patience with joy and, and then giving thanks to the Father for all that he has done for us. And so that's what we're gonna do as we continue on into the rest of verse 10 and the next several verses. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look very deeply at what this looks like to live our lives in a manner worthy of the Lord and to fully please him. I hope you're uh, ready and excited to do that like I am.